Now, if you're able to still remain standing here, uh, we're going to read uh, the third psalm uh, together. Um, it's printed uh, in your bulletin, or you can find your way there um, in your Bibles um, and follow along with us as we do that. I, uh, I so greatly appreciate Pastor Jamie and, uh, and Rachel and his family and just all that they uh, pour into the ministry here at church. And I, I genuinely look forward to hearing Pastor Jamie preach uh, every time he does that. It's a blessing to me just personally also, you know, the, the sermon preparation and all the things, it's a, it's a very heavy load um, to, to do that all the time. And so Pastor Jamie picking that up this week, let us just kind of take our foot off the gas pedal a little bit this past week. And, and I'm really grateful to that just on a personal level, level, brother. Thank you for that. But Jamie, um, as you know, we, you know, he's officially, he's the youth pastor here. Um, and is just doing such an unbelievable job uh, with our young people. I got to tell you, I just, lots of pastors have lots of trouble with their, with their youth pastors. Um, and I just, I never, ever worry about Jamie and Rachel uh, with, those, with those young people. Uh, they're just ferocious defenders of them, pour their lives and hearts uh, into those young people. And, and it's cool to watch them respond to it. And just, just every week we get new testimonies about the young people taking steps forward with the Lord. And or he's stacking up baptisms, maybe getting ready for teen camp. We're excited about what God's doing there. And... But beyond just being a youth pastor, uh, Pastor Jamie is one of my pastors. Uh, he helps pastor me, and I appreciate the way that he sharpens me up and, and helps me in my walk with the Lord. And I'm really grateful to have him as, as my friend, um, as my fellow pastor, um, and just a co-laborer for the sake of the gospel. And I know that some of you, it'll be your first time hearing him preach, and, and it's going to be a blessing to you. I love the psalm. Psalm 3 is one of my favorites. So enough preamble. Psalm 3. I know you're all standing attention. I don't even notice. I'm used to standing all Sunday. So I don't, I'm sorry. Psalm three, here we go. Verse one, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. Selah. Pastor Jamie will cover this, I'm sure. It means rest. It means think about that for a second. There are many that say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awakened, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. All right, you may be seated. Pastor Jamie, come and preach to us. Well, good morning. Good morning. I appreciate it. There you go. Looking forward to a baptism after this as well. It's going to be fun. I'm just going to dip my finger in and see how warm it is, you know, just, uh... yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> hey, we're good. There you go. You always wonder, is it going to be one of these ice cold faith testing baptisms or is it going to be a nice and comfortable one, you know, comfortable. There you go. <laughs> it's going to be good. Uh, Psalm 3 today we're going to be looking at. Um, I've been preaching through the Psalms. I was talking to my wife about this uh, last night as we were kind of going through the final like, run through of it all. And she said, you're going to re preach through all of the Psalms. I said, every single one of them, unless God tells me something different. <laughs> you know? So at the moment we're at Psalm 3. Uh, in about 20 years time, we might get to the end of Psalms. So it'll be good. There you go. Um, but have you guys ever had a really bad day? Have you ever had a really bad day? Not like one of those like frustrating, ah, this will soon be over kind of days. But more like, uh, I don't know how much you're going to emotionally recover from this type of days. You ever had one of those? Yeah. Worst day of my life. It's a great way to start a sermon, right? Yeah. Worst day of my life, April 6th, 2016. 
It popped up a couple of days ago, you know, when you do the Facebook memories and you get the picture and you go, whew, I didn't like that day. I wish that was a memory I could forget. It was the day that we had been waiting for for a long time as a family. I had applied for a green card for America and hadn't received it. I was waiting and I was waiting and we were pushing leaving America, uh, England for America to like the last point. Brexit had happened. My wife's American. She's not English. She's not from the EU. So she was invited quite politely to stay and be thrown out or to leave and be welcomed back as a visitor. So our time was running short there. April 6, 2016 was the day that we took a train up to London and I had to say bye to my family. Not knowing when I'd get my green cards, not knowing if I'd see them again in two months, in six months, in a year. And I can remember I watched my wife carrying my almost one-year-old Kyrie, my two-year-old Army walking through and she's holding Kai in her arms and she's got Army here. And I fell to my knees and I cried. I cried and I sobbed. And I waited until they went through the security gates, of course, because I'm like, not, you know, trying to wreck their whole flight. But I was there on my knees for about 20 minutes. And I had people come up to me and be like, you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, you don't, you don't really want to know. <laughs> like, you just want me to move, right? But it was a tough day. Thankfully, I'm here, obviously. <laughs> but we had, uh, we had a two-month two wait. 6th of April, I got my green card. The 7th of April, I flew to America. Uh, 7th of June, sorry. Uh, two months. It makes me emotional, so my brain goes fried. But it was a tough day. Second worst day of my life. April 2018, I learned that my granddad was passing away. My favorite person in the whole world. And uh, he was in England. And I was up in Linden, Washington. I remember I was working in a construction uh, company and I was ordering some windows for a, a contractor who came in and gave me this. And I got this email from my mom and it said, you need to get back to England ASAP. And I said, okay. And I told Rachel, that was a hard conversation at lunchtime, you know, we booked a flight and it was just me going solo. We couldn't afford the boys and me to go over there. And I get there and... We get to the airport, kiss my wife, kiss the boys, jump on the plane, take my, the flight from Spokane to Seattle, and I turn my phone off of airplane mode as soon as we hit Seattle to get the message of, your granddad passed. And I said, I'm in Seattle. I'm coming back now. And I didn't get a chance to say bye. I didn't get a chance to say bye, but I also didn't get a chance to make sure he was saved. I think that's the thing that hurts the most, you know? My granddad passed away. I had separation from my family. But the truth is, everyone has hardships, right? Those are the two days that I can look at and say, I don't want to beat those days. I don't want a worse day than that. I know there will be. I know things are going to happen. But the truth is, we all go through hardships in our lives. How, how we act. How we act in those moments. Who we turn to. It's so important. What we allow to impact us in the hardest times. Those are the hardest moments, right? What we allow in to change those. How we react. Those choices can define the situation afterwards as well. Who you've allowed in in that moment affects how you are afterwards. Who you allow in, how you react, how you choose to react. So David's choice in this psalm is to turn to God to worship God, to implore God to help instead of trying to do this in his own strength. This is the first uh, psalm with a title in a couple of my different uh, Bibles. They all say something, something along the lines of a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. This is a psalm written about the trust in the Lord in times of trouble. For context, you can read uh, 2 Samuel 15, uh, 1 through 17, 29 about this whole situation. You can go and read that couple of chapters right there. But the heart of David 
the heart of what's going on, the emotion in this difficult time is recorded in this psalm. David's son uh, Absalom had committed murder against one of his brothers, and he had been banished. He'd been kicked out. And then, when you get, and then now he's come back. He's come back to Jerusalem, and basically, he's risen against his dad. He's risen up against his father and declared himself king of all Israel. We've got... <laughs> get Again, Psalm 3 read to me. It's awesome. I'm going to remember it as well. But basically, we have this opportunity that David can choose to stand up or to flee, to trust or to go. And, and with this declaration, he has his son coming back saying, I want the throne. I want your job. I want the status. I want what you have. David's life's in danger. David's life's in danger. And in a coup like this, what would typically happen is you'd wipe out everyone who could take the throne from you. You know, you'd show up and say, well, you're the king. Well, I'm going to take you out. Where's your sons? I'm going to take all them out. Where are their sons? I'm going to take all them out so that no one can stand up against me to take the throne. So David knew that he'd be targeted here because that's what just happens. That's what happens and has happened before time and time again where people have rose up and taken over. So the one trying to usurp power would be completely willing to eliminate all possibility of David coming to take that throne back. David heard that more and more of his friends, of his people that he had trusted, kept siding with Absalom instead of him. They chose to join the rebellion against him. Not only is this a bad day that your son who's murdered someone come back in and is challenging you, now your friends are choosing him over you as well. It's a bit of a slap in the face. So when we read this psalm, we should read it with this context that David is going through what might be one of the most lonely, one of the most difficult circumstances in his life. His family's turned against him. His friends have turned against him. And he's had to run. And when you're running from someone, it's easy to run and accept the situation when you know that person doesn't like you, right? If you know that you've been butting heads with this person for, for so long in your life, and it's like, you are, you're my enemy. You're my arch nemesis, right? You're the guy that we're going to fight in the end of the movie, and it's going to be the big conclusion. I know you. I can recognize you. But it's really hard when it's your own son. When it's someone that you don't expect. And David loved Absalom. He loved him. Even through all of this distress, even through this circumstance. And spoiler alert, if you uh, read the, ch the chapter of 2 Samuel 18, specifically verse 33, we can read that David wept, that he was shaken at the death of his son, and even said, if only I had died instead of you. Let me take the place instead of him. If only I could have done that. He loved his son. And David never seemed to stop loving his son. The Bible even goes on to say that David loved Absalom more than his other sons. It's kind of crazy, but it's true. And maybe that was because he was the firstborn since David took the throne. Maybe. He was king. This is my first son after I was made king. Okay, maybe. Or maybe it was because Absalom was called handsome. And David was also known for his pretty good looks. I don't know. <laughs> it's funny when you think about that. But people often say that about my son, Army, that he's really handsome. And that obviously reflects back to me. Oh. No, no. <laughs> but you get the image, right? You get your, one of your kids looks more like the dad, one looks more like the son. And maybe that was why he loved Absalom, because he looked a little bit more like David. Who knows? Either way, there was such a love for his son. David loved, loved, loved his son. But just because there's love doesn't mean there isn't issues. Doesn't mean that there's not sin. Love, human love, isn't enough to solve the problem of sin in our lives. You can't love the sin out of someone. If I just keep loving you, you'll get over this bad habit. No. It might, might stop for a while. It might change something in the heart. It might even change their, uh, 
reaction to you of, oh, this person's really kind, I'll be kinder back. But there's still sin. And there's only one way to get rid of that. And that's Jesus, okay? Our human love will fail. It will. It falls short. And in fact, for us to trust in our human love more than anything else is just foolish. I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. God's love is more than we can ever explain, more than we could ever understand or even grasp. It is so incredible that when we look at one of the most famous pieces of scripture, we get a glimpse of the awesomeness of God's love. We have John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That he loved the whole world. It doesn't mean that the whole world loved him back. But God loves the whole world. Every single person that he gave up his son. I love my sons. I do. Truly. Wholeheartedly, I love them. I would do anything for them. And I'm not sad when to say, like, I wouldn't give them up for you. I'm sorry. They're my boys. I love them so much. I would not give them up. I'll take the hit. I'll take the shot. Let me jump in front of the car instead. Whatever needs to happen, but not my voice. That's the big difference here. God is so much better. So much more. That love is so much more incredible than what we could ever understand. And David loved his son and had that same sentiment towards the death of his son. That if he could have taken his son's place, he would have. But God, being such a loving, gracious kind, merciful father sent his only begotten son to die on that old rugged cross for our sins, for our guilt, for our shame. And David, whilst he's going through this great distress, asks for God's help. And with that expectation of God's aid, he then offers praise. He asks, expects, and then praises about it. Knowing what God has done for us, our first step in this process, whilst going through hardships, should be to turn to God. Amen. Turning to God is, is the answer that we all need. What are you doing right now? Hard times? Turn to Jesus. Turn to God. Come back to God. Don't, don't try and do this on your own. And even as we turn, we turn to God and we ask for an answer. Before we get that answer, we should just be thankful for all that he's done, all that he's doing, and all that he's planning to do. Guys, I know this is tough. I don't do this every day. I don't. I don't turn around and be like, there's a hard time coming. Thank you, Jesus, for that hard time. I'm so grateful for it. Thank you so much for the challenge that's set ahead of me. I can't wait to conquer it. By the way, I'm tired. I don't want to do it today, you know. But there is something to be said, the fact that we're even chosen or asked or have the opportunity to go through that challenge with God, with him leading us there. It's not on our own. It's with God. So we're going to go through this psalm. I'd like us to think about kind of what that looks for in your life and what type of hard times you're going through right now and how you react. Okay. So we have the surrounding storm, not an actual storm. You know, it's a metaphor for the dysfunction happening around David. We all have storms in our lives. Right now, it could be quite mellow, nice and calm. I don't know if any of you guys saw in Airway Heights. There was a bit of a storm in Airway Heights and a little bit of a, a mini tornado thing like touched down up there. It's someone called, got a really cool picture of it. And it looked kind of like that. <laughs> but it looked kind of cool. Wouldn't want to be there. <laughs> no, that storm's a bit too much. But, but the surrounding storm, whatever's going on in your life right now, the dysfunction that's happening... Think about that and how you're going to react. So we have those who troubled David and what they did, okay? Verse 1, Lord, how are they increase that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. At the writing of this psalm, David was in a great deal of trouble. His own son led what seemed to be a successful rebellion against him. Many of his previous friends and associates forsook him. And joined the ranks of those who troubled him. Second Samuel 15, 13 says, And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart. Get out fast. 
lest he overtakes us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. David saw the disaster that was coming, the storm that was coming. He tried to prepare people and tried to get out. Sometimes when you see that storm, the wisest thing you can do is walk away from it, right? You ever seen that program uh, on TV? It's the storm chasers. And people like go in their vehicles and they've got that four by four and it's got the, the forks on top of it so they can measure if they get struck by lightning, how strong it was. And you guys are crazy. It's a storm. Don't go towards it. Go away from it. What are we doing here? <laughs> I don't want that job. <laughs> I don't want that job. <laughs> we look in verse two and it says, many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. There is no help for him in God. David's situation was so bad that many felt he was beyond God's help. You ever felt like this? There's no one to turn to. No one can help me in this situation. It is literally the worst thing in the world. No one can ever understand this. It's just too bad a situation. No one can help. Those who said that this probably didn't feel that God was able to help David because of what happened before. They looked at David's past sin and kind of figured, hey, this is what he deserves. You did all that bad or bad things come to, you know, people who do bad. There is no help for him here. In 2 Samuel 16, 7 to 8, Shimei was an example of someone who said that God was against David. And he was just getting what he deserved. It says in verse 7 here, And this said Shimei, when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. Verse 8, The Lord have returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned, and the Lord have delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. He comes out and he says, You deserve this, basically. All the blood, all the things that have happened, it's on you. What you get, David, is what you get because what you did is what you did. But this is a painful thought. The thought that God might be against David. You ever felt like that? No one can help me. No one will ever understand. Even, even if I'm a good person and this is a bad situation or if I've done something bad... There is no help for him. How can you say that about someone? Spurgeon said it is the most bitter of all afflictions to be led to fear that there is no help for us in God. That there is led to fear. I, I, that's possibly one of the most scariest things. That I could cry out and someone would turn around or even God would turn around and say, I won't help you. When all the bad things pile up, when it's just one thing on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, Absalom's taken power. David's had to run. So, of course, when people start saying horrible things like, God is not going to help you, that's really helpful, guys. Thanks. Now, you ever had one of those days? Then we get this word, sila, that pause, that reflect, that meditate, almost to think. Occurring 74 times in the Old Testament. Wait, stop for a second. So we're just going to look at this for a second and we're going to pause. Because it's telling us to pause. And it's telling us to reflect. So what are you thinking about as you go through these first two verses? Do you feel abandoned by God? Is your circumstance right now a storm, a wild raging storm, or is it calm? Are you waiting for what's coming? Can you see it, you know? Are you surrounded by trouble? Are you calling on God? Just a couple of questions for you. God's presence in the storm is a big one. To know that he's not ever going to abandon us is a key part. We can be going through a storm. We can go, be going through bad times, but knowing that God is with us in those times, that's hope. That's comfort. 
that's peace. That's strength. You may not even feel strong in those times, but there is a strength there because God is there. You are never alone in those times. It's something that you may not understand or you may not think about in those times because times get tough. But it tells you something that God doesn't abandon you. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. That's a promise that we should all cling to in whatever's going on. Verse 3, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Thank goodness, right? My glory and the lifter up of mine head. There are many people saying there's no help for you from God. There's no help. You're helpless, hopeless, alone. But David knew that God was his shield. David knew. Others couldn't shake David's confidence in God because he knew who God was. How important is this that when we go and we get under attack from a cunning and ruthless enemy, you can turn around and say, I know where my confidence is. I know who's with me right now. David needed a shield. He knew that God was his shield. And notice this wasn't a prayer asking for God to be a shield. He's not saying, God, please be my shield. He's saying, oh Lord, art a shield for me. You are my shield. You are my protection. God, please be my protection. No, you are my protection. This is who I'm trusting in right now. You are a shield for me. It's a declaration, a de strong declaration of faith. And this speaks to the character of God. This speaks of the strength of God. This speaks of the promises of God. This idea of God who shields is a consistent theme or description of our God. Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those who trust in him. A buckler is like the armor on a forearm. Sometimes it would be a small shield or it would be something to glance that sword as it hits. You'd have your sword, you'd have your shield, but this would be an extra bit of protection right here. He's saying, you're my protection. Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth and my song will I praise him. Psalm 18, 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation and my high tower. One more for you in Psalm 91, 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust his truth shall be my shield and buckler. God is our protection. Do you believe that? Are you confident in that this morning? It doesn't sound like it, guys. Are you awake? Are you... This is such good hope. This is such good hope that when we think about the attacks of the devil, of the bad, you know, the enemy coming at you any time, that you don't have to be there on your own. That if you have confidence in God, that you can be confident that he is your shield. He is there right there. As those fiery darts get shot in, he will take care of them for you. Amen. Take confidence in that. Stand firm in that, com in, that, in that truth that God is our protection. Just think about how life could be so different if we truly believed that God is our shield in times of trouble. Think about how life could be so different if we had this true confidence in who God is. He's my glory and the lifter up of my head. God was more than David's protection. He was also the one who put David on higher ground, lifting his head, showing him glory. There's nothing glorious about this situation, this circumstance, right? But there was because God was there. I always think about when my kids kind of fall over or they do something wrong or like they ride a bike wrong and it twists and it fall and it scuff their knee and they're looking down and you walk over and first thing I like to do is be like, look at me, buddy, look at me. And they look up and you go, it's okay. And then you pick them up and you make sure that you, you know, wash off their cuts or anything like that. But that lifting up of the head, because it's so easy to be like, I'm under attack right now, so I'm just going to look down. But God's saying, no, get that chin up. Look at me. Look at me. I'm lifting up your head right now. 
Look at me. Don't look at that. Look at me. How different would life be if we were able to do that? In those hard times, look to God. Trust in God. Have confidence in God in those times. It's easy to not. I know that. It really is. But he is the glory and the one who lifts my head. And men, we find glory in all sorts of things. Think about our jobs, our personal fame or power, prestige, status. David found his glory in the Lord. That's the only glory that truly matters. Verse 4, I cried unto the Lord with my voice and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I cried to the Lord. I love this because sometimes... Uh, when I get really like upset or frustrated or just sad, my prayers get a little loud, <laughs> a little loud. And I, and I usually, I'll take a walk or I'll go by a bit of water because that's kind of where I just feel connection with God. Just this big body of water and I'm so small and he cares about me compared to this. Wow. But I don't stay quiet there. Usually it's like, hey man, can you just help me out here? And one time I was doing it, an army was with me, and he's like, Dad, you can't talk to God like that. <laughs> like, yeah, okay, well, but actually I can. Because God knows my heart. And if I was doing it out of anger and aggression and frustration, okay, maybe I need to check myself right there. But I'm doing it crying out to the one that I can truly trust. The one that knows me wholeheartedly. The one that hears those cries and goes, actually, Jamie's not trying to be a jerk right now. He's just trying to communicate. He's just bad at communication, right? <laughs> so the fact that David cries out, I love that. And when we read through some of these Psalms, you can read them and be like, well, this is really like tame when you read it like a normal person. But then when you think about how he might be writing it, you can say, actually, that cry, that's how this is meant to be read. <laughs> help me, God, help me, be my shield. I'm being chased, I'm being attacked, I'm being chased out of my own, uh, you know, kingdom. Help me. Help me, God. Help. Please. No, like we, we understand it's a cry, okay? There's not a silent prayer. It's a cried out prayer. Amen. That's good. David cried out with an honest heart. And thankfully, we can read that God heard him. Yeah. And it wasn't on deaf ears. God hears the cries of our hearts. And he heard me from his holy hill. Others said that God didn't want anything to do with David. He's beyond help. But he could gloriously say, God heard me. He heard. And though Absalom took over Jerusalem, forced David out of the capital, David knew it wasn't Absalom enthroned in the true kingdom. It's God on that holy hill. The Lord himself, himself still held that ground and would hear and help David from his holy hill. And then we get this word again, sila. Pause, reflect. Would you say God is shielding you this morning? If it's not God shielding you, then who? Or what are you relying on for protection? Yourself? Your own personal strength? A concealed carry, you know? <laughs> a spouse? A parent? best friend? Your plans for the future? What are you relying on? If God isn't shielding us, then it leaves us vulnerable for those fiery darts, those attacks, the unexpected blows from the enemy. And they are too much for us to handle on our own. And they're also too much to handle for other people to try and take, you know? I'll carry your burdens for a second, literally, because then I'm it's too much. I can't do it. The load is simply too heavy for us to, to bear. Trust in God. He is your shield. Who is shielding you this morning? Think about that. Then we get this, the sleep in the middle of the storm. This is funny because we had that uh, a windstorm. I don't know how many months ago. It was like two months ago, something like that. And our boys were like in bed. They're asleep until they weren't, until the wind picked up and, whoosh, 
and you hear it and it's like clanging against the house and you hear things moving outside and the boys wake up, what is it? What's going on? Ah, and then they run out just in time. So then the power goes out and they're like, mom, dad, are we a go? Ah! And it's disaster and it's panic and it's chaos and you're going, it's okay, it's just power. You know, we pull out the emergency like battery lanterns and we get the generator going and you're like, we'll be fine, it's okay. But you still hear the wind outside. It's tough to sleep in stormy times, right? That was a physical windstorm. What about our lives when they're stormy? Can you find that rest? Can you find that peaceful time to rest, even though all the dysfunction and crazy is going on? It is tough to sleep in storms. But in verse 5, we can read, I laid me down and slept. I waked for the Lord sustained me. Due to this uh, intense pressure that David was under with the rebellion from Absalom, you could think maybe sleep was hard. (laughs) That would be understandable, right? Maybe even impossible. Yet we read that David slept. What a blessing. You ever been so stressed in your life that you just couldn't sleep? Too much stuff going on? Too many things filling up your brain? You can't switch off? And even if you did eventually fall asleep, maybe you woke up and you felt more stressed. I didn't figure it out before I went to sleep. David's circumstances hadn't changed. Nothing had changed here in the fact that there was a rebellion against him, that he was a man wanted to be killed because he's going to try and take the throne back. There were people who coming against him. So what changed? What changed? David knew God. David knew God and he knew that he was no longer alone. That understanding and realization that you are no longer alone could be everything between peace and hardships right there. He's no longer alone. In verse 3, the Lord is my shield and the lifter of my head. He's there. He's my shield. In verse 4, we can read that the Lord heard me. He hears my cries. In verse 5, the Lord sustained me. He's with me. He's sustaining me. He brings me peace even in the worst places. And David experienced this chaos, this like this peace in the middle of chaos, and he slept in the middle of the storm raging around him, and the storm in his heart. He was still a wanted man, yet he slept. He slept. Have you slept lately? Like really well? Have you slept? Had a real good nap? Wake up with some bedhead, you know? <laughs> Sleeping's a good thing. Waking up's even better. It's a blessing. When someone's out to kill you, waking up means they haven't succeeded. (laughs) Right? Right? You're a wanted man. You're getting chased around. There's a rebellion. Your name's on those wanted posters. Bring them in. Bring them in. You get to go to sleep one night and you wake up the next day. Whew. They didn't get me. Man. When your own son is pursuing and you want you dead, it's a blessing to get to wake up and see another day. The Lord sustained David. He had a reason to praise God. God sustains us in our sleep. Think about that. We often take it for granted. You fall asleep, you're unconscious, you're out to the whole world, right? But whilst you're asleep, your heart's still beating. You're still breathing. You're still able to be alive, but you're asleep. You ever thought about that? How God allows that to keep happening? How God made us so that we can have this rest and everything still keeps working. And I don't have to keep thinking about it, praise God. Because I might leave an on switch off for too long and something could go bad, you know. It's a blessing. The same God who sustains us in our sleep can sustain us in times of deep distress and turmoil. In this world, there are many things that offer comfort to us, right? Just walk around Costco, right? That's dangerous in itself, right? (laughs) But you know what I'm talking about. There's always this amazing couch for sale or this beautiful bed. And you go, oh, this TV would be great. This couch is fantastic. So much comfort at hand right here. But it's all a world filled with distractions, instant gratification, and things constantly vying for our attention. 
But I've got real good news for you. It is God who sustains. And because of that, you can experience joy and peace and sleep. No matter what is happening on the news. No matter what is happening around you. No matter what is happening to you. In your family. Nothing in this world can satisfy like Jesus. Which leads us to our next point. God's truth is the anchor in the eye of the storm. What's holding you there? David's circumstances was horrible. It was horrible. People were abandoning him, yet also rising up against him. His own son wanted his throne and was willing to kill for it. And on top of that, people were letting him know that God wasn't going to help you. His circumstances were terrible. And I can't think of a worse lie to tell someone when they're already down in a ditch, wondering if things will ever be okay, that God won't even help you. Hear me this morning, guys. God sent his son on a rescue mission to save sinners like me and you. God wants to help. He does. He wants to rescue you. Don't believe the lies. Don't believe what people are saying to you. Your life matters. You have a purpose. You're here for a purpose. And no matter what the world is telling you, praise God that he is still in the business of rescuing sinners Sinners like us from death to life. Are you willing to be saved? Are you willing to be saved? There's always one of those, uh, those jokes that always get told. And they say like the guy on top of the house whilst the flood comes along, you know. And then he prays for help. And then a guy of a canoe comes along and he goes, no, nah, I'm waiting for God to do something. And he prays again and a bigger boat comes along. No, nah, I'm waiting for God to do something. And then he prays again and a helicopter comes along. He goes, no, I'm waiting for God. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Then he ends up dying. Then he says, God, why didn't you save me? He said, three times. I did. Are you willing to be saved? Are you willing to be saved? Are you willing to have this truth applied to your heart and your life? Are you willing to accept what God is doing here? Are you willing to be shielded? Are you willing to be protected? Are you too manly to accept the help, right? I can do it on my own. It's fine. I'll take on that army. Bring it, Absalom. It's all good. No. (laughs) We need God. We need him. So as David stopped and he looked at his circumstances and what was happening around him, David recognized what was true. His God was with him. The same God who had helped him so many times before. The same God who was with him when he faced the lion and the wolf and the bear whilst he's protecting the sheep. The same uh, God who was with him whilst he defeated Goliath and the Philistines. The same God who had shown him mercy and forgiveness after he committed murder and adultery. The same God. The truth of God was an anchor for his soul. His peace in the midst of all this dysfunction. And God's truth brought David back from a troublesome state. If David didn't know who God was... I don't think he could have slept. I don't think he could have. But because he had experienced God's presence with him and trusted in the unfailing characteristics of God, David slept and woke up no longer consumed by his fear. He knew what was true was true. And because of that, he experienced peace. He experienced rest. He experienced hope. God's rest leads to a sound and secure mind. Rest brings kind of calm, that moment to... (sighs) And David can now think more clearly about what's true in this situation. Are you tired, guys? Are you tired? I'm tired. Are you weary? Yeah. Is your brain tired from thinking about all the things in the whole world? Yeah. Life can be so heavy and so overwhelming at times. But God wants to give you and I rest. He does. And I'm praying that God will sustain you just like he did David. Whatever it is, God can handle the heaviness. He loves you and he cares for you deeply. Psalm 37, 7 says, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. 
Fret not thyself because of him who is prospereth in his way, because of the men who bring wicked devices to pass. Rest in the Lord and fret not. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Man, it's on offer. Are you going to accept it? Are you going to come to God and say, this is too heavy, I need a little bit of help here? Can you accept that help? Rest in the Lord. Verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. I will not be afraid. It's amazing what a little bit of sleep does, right? Right? With God sustaining him, David could stand against any foe. Before it was written, David knew the truth of Romans 8.31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. The God who sustains, the God who shields, the God who protects, the God who listens, the God who cares. Because he is with us, we no longer need to be afraid. The enemy has the position around me, all around me. They outnumber me. There's many of them, guys. But God. But God. We get to this surrender, remembrance, and worship now. Verse 7 and 8. So verse 7. Arise, O Lord, save me. O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. David's mind was on, on, on what he was trusting God to do here. Save me. Save me, God. And then what God had to do to be able to do that. And that struck all my enemies. All of them. Strike them down. Knowing that God had, what God had done gave David confidence in what the Lord could also continue to do. When he had shown up before, it allows him to focus on what's going to happen next. You were there with the lion. You were there with the bear. You were there with Goliath. And now I've got this. But I trusted you then, so why shouldn't I trust you now? We have that opportunity in our lives, I'm sure. You could look back and see where you've had to truly trust in God. Where you've had to truly cling to Jesus and say, I need you to help me get through this time. Don't forget that. Because when that time comes up again, you can look back and say, I trusted you then, and I can see what happened. And now I can trust you now, because I know what happened. There's an opportunity that we can do and look back and be able to see how good God has been. And we have this, arise, O Lord, arise. Numbers 10, 35 says, and it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered and let them that, have hate, that hate flee before thee. When Moses used this phrase, uh, the ch children of Israel broke camp in the wilderness. It was a military phrase calling on God to go forward to defend Israel and lead them to victory. Go forward, arise. This is a statement here. A declaration or uh, intent to go forward knowing that God is in charge of the defense and of the offensive drive for Israel here. So that same thing. Go forward, God, and do. Save me. Take care of those enemies. You've done it before. I know you can do it again. And break the teeth of the ungodly. Psalm 58, 6 says, Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. The enemies of David here are fierce. Like young lions ready to chomp at the bit. A young lion in Absalom coming to the old lion who's been in charge of the situation for a long time, challenging for that alpha position, right? We see it on National Geographic all the time. Yeah. And David looked for protection in this psalm. But more than protection, he looked for victory. He wanted victory here. It wasn't enough for David to survive the threat to the kingdom. He wanted to be victorious over the threat. And he would be with the blessings of God and the leading of God and the deliverance from God. Not in David's strength, but in God. That's what we need to remember here. In verse 8, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And David understood that salvation, both in the ultimate and the immediate sense, was God's property. It's his. 
It isn't the property of one nation or one person or one people group, but the Lord God. To be saved, you must deal with God himself, one-on-one. -on -one. It is a personal relationship only with Jesus Christ. Not a family relationship, not just the attendance at church. We have this idea that just because you spend a lot of time in the garage doesn't make you a car, right? Just because you come to church on a Sunday and you sit here and you go, oh, maybe. Yeah. No, right. no. If you know Jesus, if you've accepted his love, his mercy, his sacrifice on the cross for your sins, if you have confessed with your mouth and you believe in your heart, then you are saved. Right. Then you are a Christian, okay? You, don't, you can't just pretend. Because when your time comes and you're just pretending, and they say, hey, do you know Jesus? You want to come into heaven? Do you know Jesus Christ? You don't want to hear those words of, I don't know you. That's the big prayer here. Know Jesus. Trust in him. Trust in him. You must have your own relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you do not have a relationship with Christ, I'm not sure where you're going. If you're not sure where you're going when your time comes, don't leave. Don't leave without asking some questions here. Give us an opportunity to be able to talk to you and show you in the Bible about how you can know that heaven's your home. How you can know where you're going when your time comes. That Christ can be your king and he wants to save you. He does. Yeah. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And thy blessing is upon your people. And this showed David's heart, okay? It's upon your people. Notice he doesn't say, your blessing is all upon me. Thank you, God, all me. No, he says, my people, your people, right? He wasn't concerned about just himself here. He was concerned about all God's people, all of them. He didn't pray for preservation and victory in the trial for just his own sake. He's praying because it's the best thing for the whole nation. We can get so focused on what is best for us, the individual but in this instance, David is looking at the bigger picture. What is best for the nation? What is best for Israel in this situation? And then we get that word again. Selah. Oh, let me jump back. Pause. Reflect. Take note. Are you trusting in God to help you with these battles? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ for your eternal home and glory and salvation are you trusting in him because there's no other way there's no other way to get to heaven you might have a real nice house real nice job real nice car might be a real nice person i'm thankful for nice people but i'd love you to get to know jesus i'd love you to know where you're going when you die and that sounds aggressive and it's something you might not want to think about this morning but i think it's something that we should all think about Sister, would you better come and play for us? I have a couple of questions for you this morning. First one is, where do you turn to in times of trouble? Where do you turn to? Are you turning to the Bible? Are you turning to the truth? To God's words? Are you turn into a YouTube tutorial about how to get out of this situation? Do you know a really knowledgeable guy that you can rely on to tell you what to do? There's a good answer here, and there's a, there's a bad answer. Who do you turn to? If it's not God, then who is it? If you're relying on God, then you have hope. One of my favorite songs is uh, Christ the Solid Rock. And it says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand on Christ not anything else right on him because that's the truth that's where we need to be that's where we should be because he is that solid rock he is that firm foundation he is the hope he is all we need and so much more who you turn into in these times of trouble second question for you where does your confidence lie this morning where does it lie are you confident in God? Is there something in your life or your heart that's causing you to be crippled by fear? 
Brothers and sisters, it's a dangerous place to place confidence in humans. But God can handle whatever it may be. Trust him. Trust him. And the third one here. Do you need to have a time to rest? It's okay to rest. Take a nap, people. It's okay. Our time's tough. Are your circumstances just not tra- changing? Then find rest in the one who can change it all. Maybe switch off your phone, disconnect from the internet, whatever it is that's, that's filling your brain with all this crazy. Guys, this week I didn't sleep very well. I didn't. Maybe three or four hours a night each, each, each night. And that's not a woe is me moment. That's because I honestly feel like I'm going through a psalm where I'm having to turn to God and say, help me sleep. Help me rest. Help me switch off this brain so that I can look to you more clearly and understand who you are. We need to lay things down because God's the most important thing in our lives. Are you taking rest? Are you taking time to rest? And then we have this word again, Selah. Pause, reflect. Find rest in the arms of the Father. We cannot do this in our own strength. I pray you cling to Jesus in this time. Wherever you are today, take some time to do some business with God. Trust in him. Find that confidence in him.